Words of solidarity and support are wonderful and needed, but actions are better. This is a time of struggle and change for many communities, and even though this is a tech noodling YouTube channel, tech is not neutral, and this channel will never be neutral either. Links and resources for organizations working towards social justice and how you can actively participate will be in the description. You could say that I've spent a lot of time with the original ASUS Tinkerboard. I wrote all of these words. So when ASUS announced the Tinkerboard 2, I was naturally very curious. Uh, when it was released on the website, I opted for the 2 rather than the 2S, which is the other version, because the only real difference I could see was the addition of onboard eMMC, which I could really take or leave. I'm fine with an SD card for my purposes. And the price difference uh, definitely made me go 2 rather than 2S. When the Tinkerboard 2 arrived, uh, one thing really stuck out to me, literally, uh, and that was the heatsink, the comically large heatsink. Now I put it on the board as instructed because honestly seeing that I'm a little scared what would happen if it wasn't on the board, uh, but it's just so obtrusive, uh, especially compared to the original Tinkerboard's heatsink, which admittedly was a little larger than the average single board computer heatsink, but not, not like, not like that. That's just, that, that's huge. It's undeniably huge. Underneath that massive heatsink though is a Rockchip RK3399 system on chip. For CPU, it has a dual core Cortex A72 clocked at two gigahertz and a quad core Cortex A53 clocked at 1.5 gigahertz. However, uh, it's important to note you aren't constantly getting those six cores of power. The default is the A53 quad core and then when the CPU is under load, you go into, you add in that, those two additional cores of the A72 has a Mali T860 GPU, two gigabytes of RAM, which I was a little surprised, it seemed a little low, full-size HDMI, one USB-C port, three USB-3 ports, and a 40-pin GPIO header, which is color-coded. I love color-coded headers. It uses a DC barrel jack for power with a minimum of 12 volts. And that's a big departure from the single board computers that I usually play around with, including the original Tinkerboard, which was a USB power supply, five volts. So with this increased voltage and this giant heat sink, I always had to benchmark it. Uh, so before we start looking at all this data, uh, let's talk about the parameters upon which I tested all this stuff. So first off, what did I test? I ran all the tests on the original Tinkerboard, the Tinkerboard 2, and a Raspberry Pi for eight gigabyte. It's on the 32-bit Raspberry Pi OS, so the most RAM that could be accessed for a single task is four gigabytes. I thought it was fair to test with that version because if we're looking at price, the Tinkerboard 2 is almost double the price of a Raspberry Pi four gig, um, and even more expensive than the eight gig, which is the most expensive Pi. So that's my thinking there. It should be noted that unlike the Raspberry Pi boards, the Tinker boards have different distros depending on the type of board. Uh, Tinker OS is only at 32-bit for the original Tinker board, but it is 64-bit for the Tinker board too. Most of the tests are from the Ferronix test suite, which I love, with the exception of a couple of terminal-based tests and browser benchmarks at the end. All benchmarks were run with passive cooling, which means just the heatsink, default heatsink for each board out in the open air. A small fan was used to bring the boards back down to a minimum of 34 degrees Celsius in between tests so that every board would be starting off at the same base temperature when a test was run. I kept the performance scaling at on demand since that is the default for all the operating systems. And I think the average user would want that kind of scaled performance. So I thought it would be the most real world results. Now let's take a look at some charts. These charts were actually made with Python using the PLO text or PLO text library. I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce it, uh, which I picked up from a Tuesday tooling uh, blog post by Les Pounder. I'll link that down in the description. We begin with some CPU benchmarks. Tinkerboard 2 comes out on top in the single core test, which is Encode Flack from Pharonix, and Himeno, a multi-core test from Pharonix. In Git performance, the Tinkerboard 2 wins again, followed by a victory in PyBench, a Python benchmark. Hackbench is a Linux kernel scheduler benchmark that has tests for threads and processes. The Tinkerboard 2 again achieved the best results. Then for a RAM test with RAM speed, the Tinkerboard 2 again won out. But then things got a little weird. 
OS Bench is an operating system benchmark that measures time for file creation, launching programs, essentially how your operating system is performing with basic tasks. The results were kind of all over the place for all three boards, so take from that what you will. Tinkerboard 2 was best in create files, the original Tinkerboard was best in create threads, create processes, and launch programs. The Pi won out in memory allocations, which makes sense because it had the most RAM, but you know. And then graphics. On the ASUS website for the Tinkerboard 2, they have some posted up benchmarks uh, with the Tinkerboard versus the Tinkerboard 2. I never trust company benchmarks. It's nothing personal. It's not just because it's ASUS, just any company. I wouldn't really trust because they you don't know how they ran the tests or what the conditions were. And obviously they want you to think or know that like their board or whatever they're trying to sell has this amazing performance and whatever test. Specifically in this case, they're sharing the results of GL Mark II, which is a GPU benchmark. They label the results as being from GL Mark II ES, uh, both on screen and off screen. So when I ran GL Mark II ES2, I wanted to see if I could reach the benchmark scores that they were posting. And for those that are curious how I went about setting up GL Mark II, I'll link down in the description. For off screen results, the original Tinkerboard won, but still underperformed the posted ASUS results. Tinkerboard 2 came in last. On screen results were essentially the same as far as ranking, but super low. Now, sometimes this can be due to your monitor's refresh rate. Um, it's kind of tricky to get um, like full screen um, decent results because of that. So you have to keep that in mind. I just want to take a moment to mention that previously, the last time I did a benchmark, that was for the Pi 4 release in, I believe it was June 2019. At the time, GL Mark II would not run all the way through on a Pi or a Tinkerboard. Uh, it would quit out at the Jellyfish um, test. Tinkerboard, I think it got a little, little further, but not by much. So there's been progress made for all of these boards in graphics, the fact that it can complete the test successfully. I think I'm the only person on earth that cares about that, but I just wanted to share. I want to dig a little deeper though into the GL Mark tests with the two Tinker boards. So I changed the scaling governor to performance. And now that was quite the difference as expected, but still um, interesting to see. The original Tinker board essentially met with ASUS poster results for off screen. Tinkerboard 2 improved, but still did not show a match to ASUS post results and still underperformed compared to the original Tinkerboard. Getting that result though for the original Tinkerboard uh, was really great to see because it explained the discrepancies and also the testing methodologies that ASUS was using for that particular test for that board versus what I was doing. Can I explain why I couldn't achieve it for the Tinkerboard 2? No, but I at least was able to get it for the original Tinkerboard. This was followed up with another graphics test, FFmpeg, with the Tinkerboard 2 winning out. And again, that just shows there's like a lot of decent like processing power for this board. I ended my testing outside of Pharonix. I like to calculate pi to 1,000 places and then 10,000 places in the terminal. For 1,000 places, all three boards were under a second. It's hard to really parse that out because there's going to be little discrepancies. But for 10,000 places, the Tinkerboard 2 came in first, followed by the Pi 4 and the original Tinkerboard. And finally, some browser benchmarks. Pi 4 beat out both Tinkerboards in Jetstream and just barely beat the Tinkerboard 2 in Octane 2.0. And that is the data. I'll be posting up uh, my raw data along with the Python files for those charts up on GitHub if you want to peruse. Uh, I really prefer making the charts with Python compared to Excel. A lot easier to edit on the fly and everything. But as with every benchmark session, I'm left with the eternal question. What does it all mean? Who cares? What's the point? What are these numbers saying? Did the Tinkerboard 2 perform well? Yes. But uh, there's a lot of problems right now as it enters this world that are not unlike its sibling's original problems, the original Tinkerboard upon release. When the original Tinkerboard came onto the scene, it did not have a lot of support. Sometimes it felt like you had been dropped this piece of hardware and there was, that's it. You just have this brick. You were sitting in the back of the cave trying to figure out what are the shadows doing? What do they mean? The eternal question, what does this all mean? And it was in that process that I came to know the board super duper well, possibly too well. But here we are, the second iteration of this board and the same 
gaps remain. Uh, I think one of the biggest one, no real GPIO support, especially Python. Um, no documentation really beyond, you know, install the heatsink, download Tinker OS or Android and have a time. I do have to say though, uh, the current build for Tinker OS for the Tinkerboard 2 runs really well. But shouldn't that be a guarantee though? Like you, you get hardware and their software support. And I think that's, that's a Merc, that's a, that's an area of discussion. Um, especially with how a lot of these communities are, are set up. Like what, what is the expectation? Um, what is, uh, what is acceptable? And there is official Android support, which is a plus. I haven't tried it yet for the Tinkerboard 2, but I will say for the original Tinkerboard, it, it worked really well. The reason why there's the official Android port is it's the same system on chip uh, that Asus uses in its Android phones. But I guess that brings us to another question then. Why even use a Tinkerboard or any other single board computer really when the Raspberry Pi has similar, if not in some cases, better performance and without a doubt, 100% over the moon better support. The reason why I was excited about the original Tinkerboard just in general uh, was originally I was more a desktop computer hardware kind of person. I've really only shifted in recent years. So for a company like Asus to make a single board computer, it was very exciting. It's like they're giving a nod to folks in that space that, hey, this embedded hardware is an option too. It gives you the possibility to accomplish really small builds of things like home servers, media streamers, game emulation, etc., etc., and also maybe introduce more folks into Linux and the different flavors out there. I will say that although some of the hardware choices for the Tinkerboard 2 don't make a ton of sense if you're coming from the Raspberry Pi maker perspective, uh, they do make sense if you're coming from a desktop hardware business perspective, um, mainly because like you have full size HDMI, DC power jack is a little bit more substantial than USB. Um, you've got USB-C on board and there's also headers on there to like add a physical power button and also have like fan control and stuff. So that stuff like to be fair is not on a Pi and for someone who's maybe trying to deploy these like that, that makes things a lot easier. However, all of that is nothing without software support. So if you want a small embedded Linux system, this will definitely do the thing, but at a much higher price than a board like a Raspberry Pi. So as you see, as I talk in circles here, I'm really getting nowhere and I'm kind of left with the conclusion of meh. This means meh. Outlook unclear. I don't really know what to make of the tea leaves of the benchmark results. I'm left waiting for more support, but not knowing if it will ever come. If it ever does come though, I'll probably do a video on it because the Tinkerboard and I, for better or worse, are tied together. Our paths have intertwined and I have a, a weird obsession with it. I'm, that's just what's happening here. But that's gonna do it for this video. I'll post links down in the description of stuff I found, I was testing and also more information on benchmarking if you're into that. Uh, thank you for watching. Until next time, this has been Blitz City DIY.